I gave you all this information about the persecutions of the early church just to put the martyrdom of uh, Felicity and Perpetua in some context. And I know we didn't read um, The Life of St. Anthony. I'm hoping we can come back to at least parts of it when we get to the end of the semester and we do the sayings of the Desert Fathers because Anthony is um, extremely important for that because he's the first really of the named um, Desert Fathers. He's the father of monasticism for both the Church of the East and the West. It's through him that monasticism makes its way um, to the West and the rules of monasticism, the Benedictine rule and, and those kinds of things, essentially can all be traced back to um, Anthony. But we're going to talk for a few minutes about these ten major periods of persecution in the early Christian church and, you know, some of the major figures that I've um, included there just to help us understand what's going on when we read the martyrdom of um, St. Perpetua and Felicity. Because if you, if you look at that, and I meant to... Um, Try to go through and add up all those years, and we can do it really quickly. Nero, you've got four years. Domitian, 15 years, so that's 19. Trajan, five years, so that's 24. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, 19. That brings us up to 43. Um, Septimius Severus, eight. That brings us up to 51 years. Decius, one year, that's 59 uh, Valerian two years at 61, Max, Maximinus the Thracian, that's three, at 64 years, Aurelian, that's five, that's 69 years, <clears throat> and then Diocletian and Galerius, about another nine years, so roughly just talking about these ten major periods, you have a total of about 80 years of constant, let's say persecution in the first 300 years or the first 270 years of the church, okay? Or two and a half, you know, a um, little bit more than a third, okay? Um, or almost a third of that period. Now, these are the major periods. There are other, you know, periods of persecution. Each one of these is um, referencing a, for lack of a better way of putting it, an imperial period of persecution. That is, this is where the persecution is coming literally from the emperor down. Okay, Not included in this is all the local area, what we would kind of consider, you know, county or statewide persecutions, because there were a lot of those. Some areas in um, the early Roman Empire in this period, there were some areas where, where Christians were persecuted almost nonstop. And by persecuted, I don't mean they were dragged into the arena and slaughtered. I mean they were persecuted in that they were harassed. Okay, um, They weren't allowed to do business. They weren't allowed to carry on trade. They weren't allowed to buy property, etc. Okay, because of their religious beliefs, because their beliefs were contrary to the beliefs of Rome. All right, and as as well as other things. I mean, think for example of um, you know I think a, a good modern analogy might be think of the treatment of blacks in the South primarily, but also in the Northeast. You know, in the early half of the 20th century. You know, if they had drinking fountains in the first, second, third centuries Roman Empire, Christians probably wouldn't have been allowed to drink at them. Okay? Because they were held to be weird, strange. Some of them, you know, insane because of um, how they acted. So, let's begin with the first one. And I'm going to um, go over these just real briefly. I mean, if you are interested in Christian persecution, uh, be an interesting paper to talk about, or interesting paper to write. Nero, 64 to 68. 
You know, we've got the phrase, you know, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Okay, Rome apparently burned, according to some historians, according to many historians now, uh, because Nero set it on fire, and he blamed it on Christians. You know, um, Rahm Emanuel, the current mayor of of uh, Chicago, once famously said, "Let a crisis go to waste." Right? Nero didn't let this crisis go to waste. He was flagging, as it were, at the polls. He wasn't, you know, people weren't respecting him. And so what did he do? He drew attention away from himself and put it on somebody else and put the blame on them. Peter and Paul traditionally are held to have been martyred during this time. If I remember right, um, Paul's martyrdom is supposed to have occurred in 66. Um, I didn't put James the Just, James the Bishop of Jerusalem, brother of whom earlier, I said, I think the first day of class, I said, you know, his martyrdom dates from sometime between 44 and 60. Well, I was doing additional reading in preparation for today. And the James who possibly died in 44 or 45 wasn't James the brother of the Lord. That was the other James. James the brother of John, sons of Zebedee. Okay, um, James the brother of our Lord, there are two different dates if I remember right, and I've got them written down here somewhere. Um, yeah, 62 or 69. So if it's 62, it's just before Nero's persecution, and if it's 69, it's just shortly thereafter. But keep in mind, James isn't killed by the Romans. He's killed by the Jews. He's taken up to the top roof of the top, and he's thrown over. He's thrown off the um, edge of the temple. The very same place, according to church tradition, the very same place that Satan took Christ up to and said, jump because God has given his angels charge over you that, you know, if you fall, you shall not bridge your foot and stuff. Okay. Yes. And the temple was destroyed what, in seventy A.D. Seventy A.D. is when Titus uh, invaded Rome and destroyed, er, invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So we know he died. If we take the uh, account that he was thrown off the temple, we know he died before then because there wasn't much of a temple left. I mean, you could get thrown off the Wailing Wall. It's fifteen twenty feet high. You're not going to die. Um, okay. The next major one. Domitian from 81 to 96. Okay? We don't have any major um, named martyrs during this period. If I remember correctly, I think John's Gospel is supposed to have been written towards the end of Domitian's reign when John was in exile on the island of Patmos. Okay? Patmos was a penal colony. You didn't get sent to Patmos by the Jews, you got sent to Patmos by the Romans. Okay? So there as a prisoner of the Romans. Again, probably under um, Domitian. Okay? St. Ignatius dies sometime around 107. That's the date I keep seeing pop up. Um, Trajan becomes emperor. Trajan institutes a, um, another period of persecution. And I've got here Documents on the persecution of the early church. These are documents from the period. Okay, this is primary source material. And one of the really nice things for studying this history is that we have letters written from a guy named Pliny, Pliny the Younger, to Trajan. Pliny was a um, like a governor, if I remember right, over Anatolia, modern day Turkey. Okay, and he wrote letters to the emperor. About, I've got these Christians, what do I do with them? How, how do you want me to act? Okay, and so he begins this one letter. This is written right around um, late 111 or 112. And he says, and I'm not going to read all of it because it's um, fairly long. I've never participated in trials of Christians. I therefore do not know what offenses it is the practice to punish or investigate and to what extent. That is, I don't know what they do, 
that ought to be one, punished, or two, investigated. So, I have not been a little hesitant as to whether there should be any distinction on account of age, or no difference between the very young and the more mature, whether pardon is to be repentance, meaning if they repent of their Christianity, if they go back and sacrifice to the Roman gods and uh, drink the libation and such. Or if a man has once been a Christian, it does him no good to have ceased to be one. That is, if he says, yeah, I was a Christian, but I grew out of that phase. Whether the name itself, even without offenses, or only the offenses associated with the name are to be punished. So he's asking Trajan, do I punish someone for merely claiming to be a Christian? Or do they actually have to do something that makes that punishable? So he says, here's what I've done. Here is how I have treated Christians. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persevered, I ordered executed. Okay. So it wasn't just, you know, a single time. He asked them again and again and again. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, that is what they believe, stubborn inflexible obstinacy surely deserve to be punished. Stubbornness what? In their inflexible obstinacy. See, the Romans didn't believe if you had your own private God. As long as you held to the public Roman worship. They didn't, they didn't care if you added a God to all of the other gods. What they really had a problem with is when you said, no, I won't worship the emperor. I won't practice the Roman worship because my God says I can't. It was then that problems arose. Okay? So he goes on and talks about, um, he'd heard about other people being Christians. He says an anonymous document was published containing the names of many persons denied that they were or had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words dictated by me. So he stands and says, I, give your name, the person gives her name, I invoke, and he lists the gods. And the person had to then list the gods. Okay. Then they offered prayer with incense and wine to your image, which I had ordered to be brought. And, so one, they invoke the Roman gods. Two, they offer prayer in incense and drink wine to the image of Trajan. And three, they cursed Christ. None of which those who are really Christians, it is said, can be forced to do. These, I thought, should be discharged. So if somebody came forward and they did these three things, he let them go. No punishment. Okay. Others named by the informer were Christians, but then denied it, asserting that they had been, but had ceased to be. Okay. He says all of these people worshipped the image, offered the prayer, incense, and wine, and they cursed Christ. Okay. But some. He um, they asserted that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to the day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God. What does that mean to sing responsively? Leader says something and then the uh, congregation. Yeah, it's called antiphonal singing. Okay? What this is telling us is that early. By the time of Trajan, you already have this sense that there is this hierarchy where one person says something and the other people say something in response. You already have this right developing. It's not where people just go around the room and offer their own prayers and say, hey, let's sing this song. And, okay. um, they sing this hymn to Christ as to a God and they bind themselves by an oath. What? Not to commit some crime, but not to commit theft, adultery, 
not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust. When this was over, that is when they did finish, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. This they affirmed, that they had ceased to do after my edict, by which, in accordance with your instructions, I had forbidden secret societies. Okay? He says, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was. That is, these are people that, that he's now saying, people who had done all these things in the past. They'd met together, they'd sung this hymn to Christ, they'd eaten this food, they'd sworn this oath to each other. I was still a little unsure. So to find out what the truth was, I ordered by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing. That is, the female slaves said nothing. So, I postponed the and hastened to consult you. In other words, I, I, I need to know what I should do. For the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, especially because of the number involved. Now, the implication there is that he's not dealing with one or two or five or ten. He's dealing with a large number. For instance, of every age, every rank, meaning every level of society from the lowest to the highest, also both sexes are and will be. In other words, this, this Christianity has spread like a cancer through society. But it seems possible to check, that is stop, and cure it, to root it out. Okay? It certainly temples which had been almost deserted have begun to be frequented. That is, since the edict that Trajan passed, that Pliny has put into a the, the local Roman worship has started to come back. Okay. So, Trajan Beck says, You observe proper procedure, my dear Pliny, in sifting the cases of those who have been denounced to you as Christians. Notice what Trajan suggests here. He says, You've done right by sifting. What does he mean by sifting? Separating. Yeah. You've discriminated. Okay? Notice discrimination is a good thing. He doesn't say, no, no, no. You should have just killed them all. When we get later on down to Diocletian, kill them all. That's his approach. Ask questions later. Okay? So, Trajan, it's not possible to lay down any general rule to serve a fixed standard. In other words, one size doesn't fit all. Trajan doesn't want just people who are accused of Christianity killed. They are not to be sought out. That is, Christians are not to be sought out. Don't go knocking on the doors. Don't go asking people, you know, where are your papers? Or, you know, where's your cross? Kind of a thing. What's, what's this mean? This is the first century, early second century, Equivalent of, don't ask, don't tell. If the Christians don't raise a fuss, Trajan seems to be implying, they'll be okay. They're not to be sought out. If they are denounced, that is, if someone comes in and says, um, yeah, I, I know this girl, Caitlin, and she's a Christian, then you have to deal with it. If they are denounced and proved guilty, they are to be punished. Reservation. Whoever denies that he is a Christian and really proves it. How do you really prove it? By worshiping our gods. Even though he was under suspicion in the past, shall obtain pardon through repentance. All right? That's it. If they said, yeah, I was in the past, but I'm not anymore. Look, I'm worshiping the gods. That's it. It means they're clean. It's as if they've never been charged. But anonymous, anonymously posted accusations ought to have no place in any prosecution. So that means that Caroline can't just write on a note, you know, Hillary's a dirty, rotten, stinking Christian, and slide it under a door somewhere. 
These denouncements have got to be signed. Somebody has to take credit for it. All right? So that you can't just have this blanket suspicion. Why? Because this is both a dangerous kind of precedent and out of keeping spirit of our age. All right? It's a dangerous precedent, he says, to have these kinds of anonymous accusations. Okay? Um, let's see here. That's a different, that's earlier. I don't want to read that at all. Okay. <clears throat> so that's during Trajan. So we have these letters. So we know that this was occurring. Marcus Aurelius, called philosopher, king. You can, you know, somewhere in here, we've got the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, if you saw the theater, Marcus Aurelius was the one played by P, um, Richard Harris, who loved um, Russell Crowe's character. Uh, it's a son, not anything else. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, 160 to 180. It's under his period. Okay. Sharp is martyred. That Justin Martyr is martyred. Okay. In Italy. Uh, Justin Martyr, 165. Polycarp in, I can never remember. It's either 155 or 156. Um, Septimius Severus, 202 to 210. It's in. March of 2003, excuse me, March of 203, sorry, that Perpetua and Felicity are murdered. I mean, we have the actual date. It's March 7th, right, is the date of their martyrdom. Possibly, notice I've got Alban. Alban is the first named British murder. Okay, First named Christian martyr from the Isle of Britain. The earliest date attributed to his martyrdom is 209. There are two other dates, however, attributed to it. And notice, it's a span of 100 years. Very little is known about him. He was thought to be a deacon. Okay. The other possible date for um, Alban, 251, under the persecution of Decius, or Decius. And then the last one is 304, under the Great Persecution. Right, Decius, 250 to 251. This is the first universal persecution. See, these others, though I said, you know, these are kind of, they, these are coming from the emperor on down. It's not a universal persecution in that they're seeking Christians out. With Decius, they're seeking Christians out. Okay. That's why I say, you know, it's organized. You've got, you know, the quote-unquote squads, out looking for Christians, asking people questions. Not only asking them questions, but right there on the spot, you know, advice to the gods. Here, here's a little wine. Pour out a libation. Here's a prayer. Read the prayer. And we have examples, and I don't think I printed one out. Yes, I did. We have examples. Um, we have examples. This is from a very detailed and heavily footnoted Wikipedia article of a what's called a libellus. And this is from um, Decius's uh, persecution. This is a document, okay, that you could produce that exonerates you from being accused of a Christian. And several of these have survived. This is you know, a very poor copy. It's a handwritten document. It's got three different uh, hands writing it. Three different people have written it. Okay? The first part, and this is a translation. This is a papyrus um, or papyrus. Um, the first part reads, To those in charge of the sacrifices of the village Theodelphia from Aurelia Bellius, daughter of Pateras, and her daughter, Capinus. Okay, so this is me writing this on behalf of myself and my daughter. Right? We have always been constant in sacrificing to the gods. 
And now, too, in your presence, in accordance with the regulations, the regulations issued by Decius, I have poured libations and sacrificed and tasted the offerings. You know, when St. Paul writes about don't eat food, okay, offered to idols, that's what she's talking about here, all right? I poured libations and sacrificed and tasted the offerings. You to certify this for us below. It's like when you have a document notarized and you say, you know, I have done this, da 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 da, and then the notary public says, I swear and affirm that I saw this occur. So immediately after the woman writes, we hear second person's handwriting, we, Aurelius Serenus and Aurelius Hermas, saw you sacrificing. Okay? And then there's a third person's handwriting. I, Hermas, certify. And then we get the date. The year of the emperor, Caesar Gaius, Messias, Quintus, Trianus, Decius, Pius, Felix, Augustus. Pauni, 27. I don't know. I don't remember what month Pauni is. Caesar, Gaius, Messias, comes from Messiah, okay? It's the fifth after Trajan, Decius, I think it's the fifth after Trajan, one, two, no, it's not. Um, Pius Felix Augustus, okay? So, to prove that you weren't a Christian, you could sign one of these documents. Hand it over, and you're clear. Valerian, 257 to 59. Two major bishops. And we have writings of Cyprian of Carthage and Sixtus of Rome left behind. Instructions on church behavior, church belief, church doctrine, etc. They're both martyred. Because under some of these, like um, I think it is Septimius Severus and Marcus Aurelius, seeking out primarily clergy. They want the ringleaders, so to speak, rather than just the ordinary mob, because the ordinary mob may not be all that bright. But the ringleaders ought to know better, because they're leading people astray. Okay? Under Decius, it's no longer just the ringleaders. It's, we're looking for all Christians. Okay? Valerian, you've got these two major bishops. The Thracian, you have a three-year period. Aurelian, a five-year period. And then you have what's called the Great Persecution. And it's called the Great Persecution because it makes all the previous persecutions look like child's play. Okay. Diocletian primarily. Galerius was a follower. He came after Diocletian, but he merely continued. He's like, um, you know, think of it in political terms. He's like Reagan's third term, also known as George H.W. Bush. He just kind of continued the policies Reagan began. Diocletian really went hard after Christians. Okay? 303 to 312. This was a major period when a lot of Christians died. Now, book was recently published. I, I read a short review of this on Slate which I usually don't trust, um, and I didn't trust this review. Uh, a book was recently published titled, either The Myth of Persecution or The Myth of Christian Persecution. And the author in it says, essentially, um, there wasn't really Christian persecution. There was maybe a total, she argues, of about 12 years of Christian Persecuted. Yes, yes, yes. I know we have accounts of actual people being persecuted, but it was very sporadic, very infrequent. Okay. Yeah. Um, the date on Maximus the Thracian. Two thirty-five to thirty-eight. Yeah. Probably. It's, like it's, it's out of order. Yeah, it is out of order. Let me um. Yeah, I'll bet you that's supposed to be. I don't have it open there. 
65. Yeah, it might be that it's supposed to be 265 to 68. Let me um, check real quickly. Maximinus 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 Thrax. Um, hold on a second. No, two thirty-five to two thirty-eight. I just got a. It's just out of order. So it should be after Septimius Severus. Thank you for noticing that, Hillary. Okay. That's that general background. Now, let's look at the, um, the passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity. And if you're interested in saints' lives, um, what's called hagiography, um, or you're interested in others of these passions, on that same website at Fordham University, I don't know if you looked at any of the links on the left hand side but if you click for example on saints lives there's a slew of them okay from pretty early um, in the church I mean Saint Anthony's uh, life is here as are many many others okay the nice thing nice for us the nice thing about uh, the passion of saints perpetua and felicity is one this is the first <clears throat> A uh, written account of female martyrdom in the church. Okay, we're going to talk about for Thursday the life of Saint Mary of Egypt. Saint Mary of Egypt didn't die as a martyr, however, she wasn't persecuted and executed for the faith. Um, we'll read and discuss her uh, life for other reasons. Okay, so what? theme, let's say. What theme runs throughout this account of the deaths of Perpetua and Felicity? Joy? Anything else? Kind of grieving for those that they're leaving before, like grieving for the ones they leave behind because it's more painful for them. Grieving for those left behind? Okay. What else? Why joy? It's because they're going to get their rewards in heaven. Yeah. You know, so the, the joy flows from something. And the grief also flows from that same thing. It's from their faith. It's from their trust. They have no doubt whatsoever. Now, what is one of the reasons why? What happens before their actual martyrdom? And what do the visions show them? Yeah, they show them conquering, okay? They show them conquering. They show them overcoming the trials that are about to come. So, um, we hear early about who is captured or, or uh, taken, and in the first paragraph the one that's actually numbered one. It ends with a quotation from the book of Acts and Joel. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and their sons and daughters shall prophesy. And upon my servants and upon my handmaids, I will pour forth of my spirit, and the young shall see visions, and the old men shall dream dreams. Okay? And what do we come to here? They have visions. So, we also by whom both the prophecies and the new visions promised um, are received and honored, and by whom those other wonders of the Holy Spirit are assigned unto the service of the church, to which also is sent the same Spirit, administering all gifts among all men, 
according as the Lord hath distributed unto each, do of necessity both write them and by reading celebrate them to the glory of God. That is, we write down our visions. All right? Why? So that no weakness or failing of faith may presume that among those of old time only was the grace of divinity present. In other words, there are future generations saying, you will have that grace too. Okay? For a witness to them that believe and a benefit to them that believe. A witness. What does that mean? Evidence for those that don't believe. And a benefit how will it be a benefit to those that do believe? It strengthens their faith. It strengthens their faith. It, it, it builds it up and supports it. Exactly. So, we're told, second, um, whatever you want to call it, number two. They were, they were apprehended, the young catechumens, Revocatus and Felicity, his fellow servant, Saturninus and Secundulus. So was Vibia Perpetua, nobly born, reared in a liberal manner, wedded honorably. What is meant by catechumens? I guess they are being trained in like those who are being trained and like something about that. Yeah. They were being trained. They weren't yet Christians. Okay. In, in the early church and in the Eastern Church or the Orthodox Church today, when one wants to either, one, become a Christian, or two, join an Orthodox church, say you're all Christian, but you want to become Orthodox, you have what's called a period of what's called the catechumenate. And that is this period of instruction. Okay? When you are made a catechumen, and this was the case back then too, something happened to you. And what that thing was, there were by a priest and you did things too in this service. You spat on the devil, okay? You recited the creed if a creed had been written. There was no creed that we know of written at this time. There might have been a local creed. There might have been a creedal statement like we read, you know, in a couple of those letters of St. Ignatius about believing in Jesus and that he really was born and that he really lived and that he really died and really rose from the dead, etc., etc. But the catechumens were those being trained into the faith. Once your catechumen finished, that was the time for baptism. Because it's a point of baptism, that's when you really become a Christian. Why? Because that's when you die, the old man, and you rise a new person. The new person in Christ. That's the whole purpose of baptism is to kill the old man, to kill the evil. Okay? And you rise filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? To quote unquote, live a perfect life. People didn't live a perfect life. Why? Because they still fall. Filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you automatically come back up out of that water and you're suddenly sinless in the sense of you're never going to sin again. You're sinless in the sense that all your previous sins are washed clean, according to the writers of the early church. So, Revocatus and Felicity, and um, probably just those two, aren't yet baptized Christians. But they're going to have a particular kind of baptism. They're not going to have a baptism by water. They're going to have the real baptism. And I, I say real, you know, um, facetiously, because it's the ultimate baptism, the kind of baptism Ignatius was talking about. So we're told, what follows here, she, Perpetua, shall tell herself her own martyrdom. Okay? The important thing about this, like Polycarp, she tells us, okay, Polycarp tells us, you know, he's going on his way, but he doesn't write of his own martyrdom. Perpetua writes everything up to going into the arena, okay? When, she said, we were still under legal surveillance, and my father was liked to vex me with his words, 
and continually strove to hurt my faith because of his love. Says, Father, do you see? And she points to a pitcher or a vessel or something. And he says, yeah. And she says, can this, you know, cup be called a plate? Uh, no. So I can't call myself anything other than what I am, a Christian. Notice, get her to change. It's her father. Her father's not a Christian. Perpetua is. There are noble Okay. What might be, if we were to grasp it, reasons, because it's not stated, what might be one reason a Christian? His job? His social standing? He could lose everything. Okay? He's angry at her, and he comes at her, and then leaves. And she says, because I was out my father, without my father, for the Lord, and I was comforted because of his absence. It doesn't mean she's gone. Thank God he's gone. She's saying, thank God he's not being tormented by his constant. Haranguing. In the same space of a few days, we were baptized. Okay. So, so I misspoke earlier. The catechumens were not just revocatus and felicity, but they were also Saturninus and Secundulus and Perpetua. They were all catechumens. Okay. Then they get baptized. Boom. That's my place. And the Spirit declared to me, I must pray for nothing else after that water, save only endurance of flesh. So, she's baptized, and she has an experience that tells her, don't pray for long life. <laughs> don't pray for wealth or health or happiness. Pray for what? Endurance. Because the implication is, you have now died to the world. Guess what? <laughs> to die to the world. After a few days, we're taken into prison. So notice what the baptism prepares her for. And I was much afraid because I'd never known such darkness. Okay, again, she was nobly born. She's tempered most of her life. With servants. Okay, Felicity is a servant. Slash slave. She's really a slave. Oh, bitter day, there was great heat because of the press. What does she mean because of the press? It's the press of the people in the prison. There are a lot of Christians in there. And the press means there's not a lot of room. And around. So you put... All these bodies, let's say it's a room this side. You put all these bodies in here, what happens to the heat of the room? It rises to about 98, 98.6. All right? Last tormented there by care for the child because she's a young mother and she has her baby with her. So the blessing told, ministered to us, and they obtained with money that for a few hours which would be taken forth to a better part of the prison and be refreshed. In other words, they bought off the guard so that they could go out for, you know, a little bit of R&R, &R, where they could get away, you know, space with each other and have their own, quote unquote, you know, personal space, get some free air. During, she says, I suckled my child that was now faint with hunger. Why? Because the implication is when they're back in that room of the prison, there's not even room for her to hold her child to her breast. And being careful for him, I spoke to my mother, strengthened my brother, commended my son. That is, something happens to me, take the child. I pined because I saw they pined for my sake. Her mother are also not Christians. Such cares I suffered for many days. I obtained that the child should abide with me in prison. I came well, was lightened of my labor. Once she was able to take care of the child, okay, her attitude lightens a little bit. And suddenly the pr prison was made a palace for me. 
She doesn't mean that literally. It's up here that it becomes a palace. Satan in John Milton's Paradise Lost famously says, Better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. Why? Because he says the mind can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. It's all how you think about it. Okay? Once she has her child with her, her whole attitude is. So, her brother says to her, You're now in high honor. Even such that you might ask for a vision should be shown you whether this be a passion or else a deliverance. That is, you should ask for a vision and tell you whether what you're experiencing now is a passion, meaning suffering leading unto death, or a deliverance, that is, out and go back to live in this world. So she says, I, knowing that I conversed with the Lord, for whose sake I had suffered such things, did promise him nothing doubting. That is, I promised him, what? That she would seek this vision, doubting nothing. But what does Christ say in the parable of the uh, mustard seed? If you have faith, you can move mountains. Ask, and you shall receive. But how do you have to ask? With faith. So, I said, tomorrow I'll tell you. And I asked, Lord, show me. And she said, this is what I saw. I beheld a ladder of bronze, marvelously great, reaching up to heaven. And it was narrow so that not more than one might go up at a time. And in the sides of the ladder were planted all manner of things of iron. Notice, what kinds of things of iron? Swords, spears, hooks, knives. These are all sharp things designed to trip you up or to catch you. So that if any that went up took not good heed or looked not upward, he would be torn and his flesh cling to the iron. So, you've got this image of a ladder leading upwards. Okay? Like this. And all along the side are these sharp things, you know, hooks, swords, knives, etc. What's her point? Where must you keep your eyes? Focused where? Okay. On the goal. On the prize. Okay, to be received. But if you focus... Down here, what happens, she says? You get snagged, you get tripped up. Okay? And there was, a, there was, right at the ladder's foot, a serpent line, marvelously great, which lay in wait for those that would go up and frighten them that they might not go up. She doesn't mean that the ladder is lying here at the foot of the serpent. Where's the serpent line? Here. So what do you have to do to step on the first rung of the ladder? You got to step on the serpent. Okay. Notice, it was there to frighten those so that they may not go up. Now, Saturus went up first who afterwards had of his own free will given up himself for our sakes, because it was he who had edified us, that is, taught us. And I think what she means by that is that he was really the one who kind of is responsible for them becoming Christians. And when we were taken, he had not been there. That is, he hadn't been in the same place that we were when we were taken and thrown into prison. He came to the ladder's head and he turned and said, Perpetua, I await you. But see that serpent bite you not. And I said, it shall not hurt me in the name of Jesus Christ. When she says in the name of Jesus Christ, what is she doing? This is like an exorcist casting out a demon. She's saying, 
I trust wholly in the Lord. It's not going to hurt me. And from beneath the ladder, as though it feared me, it softly put forth its head. And as though I trod on the first step, I trod on its head. Why? first messianic prophecy. You will crush its head and it will bruise your heel. Okay. And I went up and I saw a very great space of garden. That is, not midway through the ladder. When she got to the top of the ladder, that's when she sees a very great space of garden. It's paradise. Not Garden of Eden paradise. The real paradise. And in the midst of man sitting, white-headed in shepherd's clothing, tall, milking his sheep, standing round in white were many thousands. And he raised his head and beheld me and said to me, Welcome, child. And he cried to me, and from the curd he had from the milk, he gave me as it were a morsel. I took it with joined hands, ate it up, and all that stood around said, Amen. And at the sound of that word I awoke. Yet eating, I know not what of sweet. Meaning, she woke up, and she was eating something. So, mere vision or something else? So who's the old man with the white hair? The ancient, I mean, the description is of the ancient of days from the Old Testament. But he's a shepherd. Okay. Yeah, Caroline. Okay, so... You know, she was clearly a Gentile. So would she have really understood all her um, Old Testament references? Sorry, I don't have any idea what that means. Hold on a second. Here's what I read some text. Um, yes, I see that. Uh, okay, nothing there. Um, I don't know. Um, it depends on the extent of her catechumenate, um, because that would involve, the catechumenate normally would involve in the early church, you know, learning about the teachings of Christ, which keep in mind at this point, the year 2000, uh, you don't have a quote unquote New Testament. Um, the gospels had been written. They'd been copied. There were people who know about of the Gospels. Some of the letters of um, Paul had probably already been circulated so that you, you've got, quote-unquote, going around. Um, she's from Carthage, which isn't real close, but it's in the North African coast. Alexandria was a major... Um, Jewish city. Uh, and there was a lot of Jewish learning in Alexandria. So, I mean, it's, it's possible she could have learned some of, you know, the biblical stories and such. Um, but I think on the basis of, of just the passion itself, you know, the vision is something that comes from outside of her. Whether she understood all of it. I think she under, She definitely understood the basics. I mean, she understood the latter is her coming passion. She understood the garden is paradise. And that's heaven. And Christ is the gardener, the shepherd. Okay? And all the people standing around, around him are all those who have already received their reward. But she wakes up and she, what does she tell her brother? It's a passion. How does she know passion? She has to overcome Satan. Literally, she has to come over Satan. Okay? And probably also because of the sweet taste in her mouth. Okay? Christ says, come, see. So, a few days afterwards, the report goes abroad that they're going to be tried. Okay? Her father comes back, begs her, 
She said, uh, he says to her, give up your religion, not destroy us altogether, for none of us will speak openly against men again if you suffer anything. And she says, you know, he said this love. I know he loves me. Kissing my hands, groveling at my feet, etc. And she says, and I agree for him. Why? Because rejoice at my passion. How does he look at it? This is a useless, waste of death. Because he doesn't believe in the whole ladder. Um, we're going to talk about later, at some point, probably when I get to the Desert Fathers, um, we're going to talk about a later named St. John of the Ladder, or St. John Climacus, who writes a book... Um, called The Ladder of Divine Ascent, okay? And it's, it's a book of 33 steps, rungs, on a ladder. And you have to start down at the bottom one, and you achieve steps as you become more and more and more purified, holy, sanctified, etc. It's a book that, you know, a lot of people read. They read it during the period of Great Lent. But it's not a book that you can ever really know or ever understand. It's like, you know, think of a novel that you read and then you keep going back to it. Because the more you read it, the more you see and the more. It's like that. It's like an onion. You just keep peeling, but it's like the onion gets bigger and bigger the more layers you peel away. So, she comforts him. Saying, um, that shall be done at this tribunal, whatsoever God shall please. In other words, she's saying, whatever pleases God, that is what the tribunal. If I live, that will be pleasing to God. If I should die, that will be pleasing to God. For know that we are not established in our own power, but... Okay, be quiet now. Um... What does that mean? She's saying, you know, to oppose Walt Whitman, I am not the master of my fate. I am not the captain of my destiny. She is saying, we are all in God's hands. And what does her father do? He goes away sorrowful. Why? He doesn't believe any of that. So, another day at a meal, and they're snatched away to be tried, she says. And we came to the forum. A report spread abroad th uh, through the parts near to the forum, that is, so people start to come to the forum. We go up to the tribunal. The others being asked, confessed. That doesn't mean they said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It means they confessed. They said loudly, yes. I am a Christian. They don't hide from it. So they came to me, and my father appeared there also with my son. So it's it's almost like you got, you know, the others go up, yeah, we're Christians. And it's her turn to go up, and then her father kind of comes out from the shadows and goes, and holds her baby in front of her. Think of you, think of the children. Think of your child. Okay? And he would draw me up, saying, perform the sacrifice. Have mercy on the child. And Hilarion, the procurator, he that after the death of Minucius Timinian, the proconsul, had received in his room the right and power of the sword, said, spare your father's gray hairs. Spare the infant boy. Make sacrifice. You almost get the impression that even the procurator wants her you don't have to do this. I'm a Christian. And when my father stood by me yet to cast down my faith, he was bidden by Hilarion to be cast down, bitten with a rod. So her father gets beaten. And I sorrowed for my father's harm as though I had been smitten myself. So Hilarion passed sentence, condemns them all to the beasts, and we cheerfully go down to the dungeon. Cheerfully how? I'm reading into this. Probably singing hymns. 
Because we have accounts of other Christians doing that. Okay? Then because my child had been used to being breastfed and to staying with me in the prison, she sends to Pomponius the deacon to her father, asking for the child, but my father would not give him. And as God willed, he didn't need to be breastfed anymore. Nor did I take fever. That is, her breasts weren't full of milk and she wasn't in pain. Look how that just happened to work out. You know? A few days later, they're praying, and in the midst of the prayer, she utters a word named Dinocrates. And she doesn't know why, because he'd never come to the mind before then, or he had never come into her mind. I sorrowed, remembering his fate. And that night, she has a vision. And she held, she sees Dinocrates coming forth from a dark place, where many others came also. Being hot and thirsty, his raiment foul, his color pale, wound on his face which he had when he died. He was seven years old when he died. He was her brother. And the wound on his face was from the ulcers from the disease he had that caused his horrible death. And so what does she do? She prays for him. Now, how does Denocrates die? I don't mean how from what illness. How in what state is his soul? Is he a Christian? No. Okay. So she prays for him and she notices that between him and me is a gulf. But she also says, where she saw Denocrates, there's a font full of water. And it's higher than the boy's stature. And Denocrates stretches up. He wants to try to drink from this font of water. And she wakes up and she knows her brother is in travail. Her brother's dead. He's in sorrow. He's in labor, as it were. But I was confident I should ease his travail. And she prays for him every day until she goes over to the camp prison. And she prays for him day and night that he might be given me. And then one day she says, while she abode in the stocks, she has this vision. I saw that place which I had before seen. We don't know how much time passes by. Just some does. And now she sees Denocrates clean of body. That is, all the blemishes are gone. Finely clothed. The tattered clothing is gone. In heart. And the font that before stood above him now only reaches to him. And he drew water from thence which flowed without ceasing. And on the edge was a golden cup full of water. And Denocrates came up and began to drink therefrom, which cup not. So what's the cup? Think of Christ's interaction with the Samaritan woman. He goes, he sends the apostles in, in town, the disciples in town, he stops at a well, he asks for a drink of water, and she said, what are you doing asking for me? You know, you, a Jew, asking for me, a Samaritan, a drink of water. And he says, if you knew who it was that I was asking you for water, you wouldn't ask. <laughs> but, and he goes on and tells her her whole history. I know about your five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. <laughs> if you would ask for me, I would give you a cup of living water. The who drinks from that cup never thirsts again. That's the symbolism of the font and the water in the font flowing from it never stops. Okay. And notice her brother drinks from a golden cup, a pure cup. And how does he appear? Perfect. So what has happened? The implication is it's her prayers that has enabled this to happen. It's not her prayers that enable him to be you know, strong and mighty. 
It's her prayers that make, not make, it's through her prayers, let me put it this way, it's through her prayers that her, her brother is healed, cured, however you want to put it. Okay. So what does that say about the state of the soul after death? Is the state of the soul after death permanent, fixed in the state it was at the point of death? Not according to St. Perpetua. Okay. Not according to her. So she wakes and she thinks he's translated from his pain. Pains have ended. A few days later, um, yeah, skip that chapter. Go on to um, number 10. The day before we fought, she says, I saw in a vision that Pomponius, the deacon, had come hither to the door of the prison, knocked hard upon it. I go out to him, I open to him, he's clothed in a white robe, ungirdled, having shoes curiously wrought. Why is he in a white robe? It's a baptismal robe. Not necessarily literally, but it's the, the robe of baptism that one gets after a baptism. It's the white robe that the book of Revelation says is given to those who overcome. Okay? And he says, Perpetua, we await you. Come. He takes my hand and we go through rugged and winding places with hard breathing into the amphitheater and he leads me into the midst of the arena and he says don't be afraid I'm here with you and I labor together with you and he went away and I saw much people watching closely and because I knew that I was condemned to the beast I marveled that the beasts were not sent out against me there against me a certain ill-favored Egyptian with his helpers meaning this guy was ugly and foul and despising um and they come, and there also came to me comely young men, my helpers and haters. And I was stripped naked, and I became a man. Well, that's weird. Helpers began to rub me with oil. Why? Okay, it makes you harder to grab. Why else? This is the Greco-Roman wrestling pattern. You slather yourselves up with oil, and then you go into the agon as in agony, the competition, the trial. Okay. She is getting ready for her battle. And so the beautiful young men who come and help her, these aren't literal men. These are probably angelic coming and preparing her. And she changes into a man, not because, you know, the church is anti-woman or anything, but because are quote-unquote manly. Okay. So, she says, And there came forth a man of very great stature, so that he overpassed the very top of the amphitheater. Okay, this guy's big. <laughs> Wearing a robe and girdled beneath it, between the two stripes, a robe of purple. Why purple? Royalty. Having also shoes curiously wrought in gold and silver, bearing a rod like a master of gladiators, and a green branch. And he said... Egyptian, if you conquer this woman, you shall slay her with the sword. If she shall conquer him, she shall receive this branch. What's the branch? It's the Lord's branch. It's the victor's branch. He went away. They go nigh to each other. They began to buffet each other. He tried to trip up my feet, and I with my heel. We have that language again. Smote upon his face. Okay. And she rise up into the air and began to smite him as though she was the earth. Like she's suddenly, you know, floating. Think, you know, Yoda or some crouching tiger, hidden dragon, you know, martial arts stuff. But when I saw that there was yet delay, I joined my hands, setting finger against finger of them. That is, she gets her hand. And what does she do? She caught his head and falls upon his face, and I trod upon his head. And the people began to shout, my helpers began to sing. She to the master of gladiators and received the branch, kissed me and said, Daughter, peace be with you. And I began to go with glory to the gate called the gate of life. Meaning death. But it's only death here. 
its real life on the other side of the gate. And all, almost all, that I'm aware of at least, the early writers of the church referred to this world. I mean, this is really the, the anti-world. Not anti in the sense of opposite to. The A-N-T-E, as in before. The place before. The real world. The real life. And she wakes up. And what does she realize? I'm not going to be fighting against beasts, but with the devil. And on the basis of her vision, what does she realize? I will overcome. But is it just her coming? No. It's her and the grace that has been given to her. You know, those young men coming up. Those are the energies or the powers of God helping her. Thus far have I written this till the day before the games. That is, but now it's game time. So I got to stop writing <laughs> and head off to the battle. And Saturus then picks up and writes about his vision. Um, he says, We'd suffered flesh, we began to be carried towards the east. Why towards the east? It's the image of Jerusalem. Okay. Those whose hands touched us not. We went upwards as though on our backs, but it was an easy hill. We passed over the world's edge. We saw a great light. They saw this beautiful. The height of the trees was after the manner of the cypress. Their leaves sang. And there in the garden were four other angels, more glorious than the rest. And they gave us. They said, here they are, here they are. And they marveled. The four angels who bore us set us down trembling. We passed on foot by a broad way over a plain, and there we found Jucundus and Saturninus and Artaxius, who had been in the same persecution. Only their martyrdom had been different because they were burned alive. Quintus and the other angels said, Come in, come in, go salute the Lord. And they came in to walls built of light. Now, that's pretty cool. Light walls. Before that door, that four angels stood in white, and they heard a voice crying out, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Okay, that's, I filled in the rest of it. And we saw sitting in that same place, as it were, notice, as it were, in other words, really, <laughs> but it's like it was. A man, white-headed, hair like snow, youthful of countenance. This is, again, the image of the ancient, ancient of days. Whose feet we saw not. On his right hand, why did they see his feet? His feet are like impure. Um, not necessarily. What is the earth? The footstool of the Lord. The reason they don't see his feet is because his feet kind of extend downwards, I think. Okay. Um, and we, we kissed him, he kissed us, and with his hand he passed over our faces, and the other elders said to us, stand you, we stood, they gave the peace is a technical term. This is an aspect that goes back at least to the century. Okay? When they would take the Eucharist, the love meal, they would give each other the kiss of peace. The kiss is essentially saying something like, Christ is in our midst. Because what does he say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with you. Okay? Um, the elder said to us, go play. And I said to Perpetua, you have what you desire. That is, this is what you've wanted. And she said, yep, God be thanked. We go out, they go before the door, the Optatus, the bishop, they, leave, they see Aspatius, the priest and teacher. Okay. Now, we get the um, narrative of the actual martyrdom. Okay. So what we saw before were the visions of the martyrdom that was to occur. And then we hear about Felicity. Felicity's eight months pregnant. Lo and behold, just before her martyrdom, she delivers. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. Paragraph 17. On the day before the games, that is, their martyrdom, when at the last feast, which they call free, they made, that is, their last meal. Okay, the Romans apparently had a tradition like we have. Our tradition is based on theirs. No. One person gets what? Whatever they want for their last meal. Still holds true. You know, if you're in San Quentin in California, you're on death and you're up to be executed tomorrow, you can ask for your last meal, whatever you want. I mean, two two inch thick steaks, potatoes, ice cream, sun, whatever. You get it. Okay? But we're told here that it's not a free feast, but a love feast. This is meaning the Eucharist. That's what they took as their last meal, the body and blood of Christ. Okay? So the dawn comes of the morning of their, their victory. And what do we see? Perpetua begins to sing as already treading on the head. Who's the Egyptian? Satan. Why? Because the vision has already been related. So the person who's writing this says, know about her vision. And she goes out there and she is singing hymns of praise. As though she's already won. Saturninus, Saturninus and Saturus threatened the people as they gazed. Then when they came into Hilarion sight, they began to say to Hilarion, judge us. You judge us. And God judge you. People become enraged. But he who had said, Ask and ye shall receive, gave to them asking that end which each had desired. That he gave to them the end they required, or they desired. Murdered them. So, Revocatus first had to do with a leopard, and afterwards was torn by a bear. And then Saturus was confident that he would die by the bird, which turned the page, and he does. Okay? But for the women, the devil had made a most savage cow prepared for this purpose against all custom. Stripped and then made to put on nets and brought forth. In other words, they're essentially nude. Okay? People shudder. It means the crowd. They don't like what they're seeing. So it stopped, and clothes are put back on them. Um, let's stop there, and then we'll pick up on 